Let me ask you about the war in Ukraine. Oh, yeah. I got into plenty of trouble about that, too. You're, <laughs> you're just a man in a suit talking on microphones and writing brilliant articles. There's also people dying, fighting. It's their land, it's their country, it's their history. This is true for both Russia and Ukraine. Yep. It's people trying to ask, they have many dragons and they're asking That's themselves sure. a question, who are we? What is yeah. this? What is the future of this nation? We thought we are a great nation. And I think both countries say this and they, they say, well, how do we become the great nation we thought we are? Yeah. And so what, uh, first of all, you got in, in trouble. What What's the, the dynamics of the trouble? And uh, is well, it something wasn't you that regret no, saying? No, no, I thought about it a lot. I laid out four reasons for the war. And then I was criticized in the Atlantic for the argument was reduced to one reason, which was a caricature of the reason. I gave a variety of reasons why the war happened. Mismanagement on the part of the West in relationship to Russia and foreign policy over the last, since the wall fell. It's understandable because it's extremely complex. Hyper-reliance on Russia as a cardinal source of energy provision for Europe in the wake of idiot environmental globalist utopianism. Um, the expansionist tendencies of Russia that are analogous in some sense to the Soviet Union empire building. And then the last one, which is the one I got in trouble for, which is Putin's belief or willingness to manipulate his people into believing that Russia is a salvific force in the face of idiot Western wokeism. And that's the one I got in trouble for. It's like, while well, you're justifying Putin, it's like, it's not, well, only, it's not only the Russians that think the West has lost its mind. The Eastern Europeans think so too. And do I know that? It's like, well, I went to 15 Eastern European countries this, this spring and I talked to 300 political and cultural leaders. And you might say, well, they were all conservatives. It's like, actually, no, they weren't. Most of them were conservatives because it turns out that they're more willing to talk to me. But a good chunk of them were liberals by by any stretch of the imagination. And a fair number of them were canceled progressives. Well, so, because you're very concerned about um, the culture wars that perhaps are a signal of um, a possible bad future for this country and for this part of the world, that reason stands out. And do you, sort of looking back at four reasons think it deserves to have a place in one of the four. Oh, because absolutely. It, because it is, you know... Uh, well, the four was bifurcated, eh? Because I said, look, Putin might believe this, and I actually think he does, because I read a bunch of Putin's speeches, and I have been reading them for 15 years. And my sense of people generally, and this was true of Hitler, it's like, what did Hitler believe? Well, did you read what he wrote? He just did what he said he was going to do. And you might think, well, some people are so tricky... They have a whole body of elaborated speech that's completely separate from their personality, and their personality is pursuing a different agenda, and this whole body of speech is nothing but a front. Yeah. It's like, good luck finding someone that sophisticated. First of all, if you say things long enough, you're going to believe them. That's a really interesting and fascinating and important point. Even if you start out as a, as a lie, as a propaganda, I think... Hitler is, is, is an example of somebody that I think really quickly you start to believe the propaganda. Well, it's you're, really interesting. You, you've thought a lot about AI systems. It's like, don't you become what you practice? And the answer to that is, well, absolutely. We even know the neurology. It's like when you first formulate a concept, huge swaths of your cortex are lit up, so to speak. But as you practice that, first of all, the right hemisphere stops participating. And then the, the, the left, participates less and less until you build specialized machinery for exactly that conceptual frame. And then you start to see it, not just think it. And so if you're telling the same lies over and over, who do you think you're fooling? Think, well, I can withstand my own lies. Not if they're effective lies. And if they're effective enough to fool 
millions of people, and then they reflect them back to you, what makes you think you're going to be able to withstand that? You aren't. And so I do think Putin believes, to the degree that he believes anything, I do believe that he thinks of himself as a bulwark for Christendom against the degeneration of the West. And that's that third way that Dugan and Putin have been talking about, the philosopher Alexander Dugan and Putin, for 15 years. Now, what that is, is very amorphous. Solzhenitsyn thought the Russians would have to re return to the incremental development of Orthodox Christianity to escape from the communist trap. And to some degree, that's happened in Russia because there's been a return to Orthodox Christianity. Now, you could say, yeah, but the Orthodox Church has just been co-opted by the state. And I would say there's some evidence for that. I've heard, for example, that the Metropolitan owns, now I don't know if this is true, owns $5 billion worth of personal property. And I would say there's a bit of a moral hazard in that. And it's possible that the Orthodox Church has been co-opted, but there has been somewhat of an Orthodox revival in Russia, and I don't think that's all bad. Now, even if Putin doesn't believe any of this, if he's just a psychopathic manipulator, and unfortunately, I don't think that's true. I've read his speeches. It doesn't look like it to me. And he is by no means the worst Russian leader of the last hundred years. Well, there's quite a selection there. There, there certainly is. But, and I say that knowing that, even if he doesn't believe it, he's convinced his people that it's true. And so we're stuck with the, we're stuck with the claim in either case. And that's the point I was trying to make in the article. Sometimes I'm troubled by people that explain things. And I, I've, a lot of people reached out to me, experts telling me how I should feel, what I should think about Ukraine. Oh, you naive, Lex, you're so naive, you know, here's how it really is. But then I get to see people that lost their home. I get to see people on the Russian side who believe they're, I, I genuinely think that there's some degree to which they have love in their heart. Uh, they they see themselves as heroes saving a land from, uh, from Nazis. How else would it's, you motivate young men to go fight? It's just, it's these humans destroying not only their homes, but creating generational hate, destroying the possibility of love towards each other. They're, they're basically creating hate. What I've heard a lot of is on February 24th of this year, hate was born at a scale that region has not seen. Hate towards not Vladimir Putin, hate towards not the soldiers in Russia, but hate towards all Russians. Mm -hmm hate that will last generations. And then you can you, you can see on, um, just the, the pain there. And then, then when all these experts talk about uh, uh, agriculture and energy and geopolitics and yeah, maybe like what you say with, with the fighting the ideologies of the woke and so on. I just feel like it's missing something deep that war is not fought about any of those things. War is started and war is averted based on human beings, based on well, here's, humanity. Well, here's, here's another ugly thought, since we haven't had enough so far. We locked everything down for COVID. How much face-to-face -face communication was there between the West and Vladimir Putin? How about none? Yeah. How about that was the wrong amount? Especially given that Europe was completely dependent on Putin for its energy supplies. Well, not completely, but you know what I mean. Materially and significantly. So maybe he had to go talk to him once every six months. Maybe he's in a bit of a bubble. Probably. And not just... In information bubble, how all these experts tell me about. Yeah. No, a human, human bubble. You human bet, bubble. Man. Look, one of the things I've really learned, there's a real emphasis on hospitality in the Old Testament. I just brought all these scholars together to talk about Exodus. Hey, I have this security team with me, and they're tough military guys, but they're on board for this mission, let's say. 
And so they went out of their way to be hospitable to my academic guests. They laid out nice platters of meat and cheese and crackers. They spent all day preparing this house I had rented so that we could have a hospitable time with these scholars, most of whom I didn't know well, but who said they would come and spend eight days talking about this book with me. We rented some jet skis. We had a nice house. We had fun. And we got to know each other. And we got to trust each other because we could see that we could have some fun and that we could let our hair down a bit. We didn't have to be on guard. And that made the talks way deeper. And then we found out we couldn't get through Exodus in eight days. And so I had proposed very early on that we're going to double the length. And so I pulled eight people out of their lives for for eight days. That's a that's not an easy thing to do. It's also quite expensive. And the Daily Wire Plus people picked all that up. And they said, right, they said, yes, right away. So we'd love to do this again. Well, why? Well, partly because it was it, intellectually, it was unbelievably engaging. I learned so much. It'll take me like a year to digest it, if I can ever digest it. And but they had they had a really good time. And so when they were offered that combination of intellectual challenge, let's say in hospitality, it was a no-brainer. They just said, every one of them said, if I can do it in any way, I will definitely be there. And this, I went to Washington a bunch of times, and the, the culture of hospitality has broken down in Washington. 40% of congressmen sleep in their offices. They don't have apartments. Their family isn't there with them. They don't have social occasions with their fellow Democrats or Republicans, much less across the table. And so, and I tried to have some meetings in Washington that were bilateral a couple of times, get young Republican congressmen and Democrats together to talk. And as soon as they talk, they think, oh, it was so interesting because one of the lunches was about 15 people, half Democrats and half Republicans. And all I'd asked them to do was just spend three minutes talking about why you decided to become a congressman, which is not a job I would take, by the way. You spend 25 hours a week fundraising on the telephone. Your family isn't there with you. You have to run for re- re-election every two years. You're beholden to the party apparatus, right? You're vilified constantly. This is not, you know, people think, well, this is a job for the privileged. It's like, yeah, you go and run for Congress and find out how much fun it is and put your family on the line and then have to beg for your job every two years while your enemies, the worst of your enemies are vi- and the worst of your friends are v- viciously henpecking you. And so anyways, we had them all sit around a table and said, okay, just say why you ran for Congress. And it was so cool, especially for a Canadian, because you Americans, you're so bloody theatrical. It's such something to watch. It was like Mr. Smith goes to Washington for every one of them. It's like, well, this country has given us so much. Our families have been so, so uh, we've benefited so much from our, from our time here. We think this is a wonderful country. We really felt that we should give back. Then the next one would talk, and it was like exactly the same story. And then it didn't matter if they were Republican or Democrat. You couldn't tell the difference. No one could. And was it genuine? It's like, well, are you genuine? You think these people are worse than you? First of all, they're not. Second of all, they're probably better, all things considered. It's not that easy to become a congressman. And I'm sure there's some bad apples in the bunch. But by and large, you walk away from your meetings with these people, and you think, Pretty they're, impressive. They're, they really are giving a part of themselves in, in the name of service. Maybe over time, they become cynical and become jaded and worn down by the whole system. But I think yeah. a lot of it- Could you imagine that? Is healed, I think. And I don't think I'm, well, I'm in part naive, but not fully, that a lot of it is healed through the power of conversation, just basic social interaction. I do think that the you bet, man. the effects of this pandemic, especially by listening, l- listen, just sitting there, and it doesn't have to be talking about the actual issue. It's actually humor and all those kinds of things uh, about personal struggles, all those kinds of things that remind you that you're all just humans. Yeah. Well, the great leaders that I've met, because and I've met some now, they go listen to their constituents. It's not a policy discussion. It's not an ideology discussion. They go say, okay, what's, what's, your, what's your life like? And what are your problems? And tell me about them. And then they listen. And then they're struck by them. And then they gather up all that misery and they bring it to the congressional office or to the parliament. And they think, here's what the people are crying out for. 
And the good leaders, that's a leader. Leader listens. So I, I talked to Jimmy Carr about comedy. And he's sold out stages worldwide on a tour, being funny. That's hard. He said, comedy is the most stand-up comedy, which is what I do in some real sense. It's a thing I do that it's most akin to what I'm doing on my book tours, I would say. It's the closest analog. He said, it's the most dialogical enterprise. And I thought, well, why? What do you mean? Because it's just a monologue. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a pre prepared monologue. I mean, you have to interact dynamically with the audience while you're telling your jokes and you got to get the timing right, but you have a body of jokes. He said, well, here's how you prepare the jokes. And I've been told this by other comedians. You go to 50 clubs before you go on your tour and you got some new material and you think it's funny and you go into a club and you lay out your new material and people laugh at some of it. And you pay attention to what they laugh at and what they don't laugh at. So you subject yourself to the judgment of the crowd and you get rid of everything that isn't funny. And if you do that enough, even if you're not that funny, the crowd will tell you what's funny. So you can imagine, imagine you do 50 shows and each is an hour long and you collect two minutes of humor from each show. So you throw away 90, you throw away two hours, more than 98% of it. You collect two minutes per show. So you're not very funny at all. You're like funny 2% of the time. You aggregate that, man, you're a scream. So, so, the, so that's what a leader does. Is That is what a leader does. He goes out and he aggregates the misery, you know, and the hopes. And then I do think that's revivifying to someone who would otherwise be cynical and jaded because then the person can say to themselves, despite the inadequacies of the system and my inadequacies, I'm, I'm gathering up the misery and and the hope, and I'm bringing it forward where it can be giving redressed. It a, yeah. Giving it a voice. Yep, giving, that's right, giving it a voice. 